we are talking about what it made uh, Skibbereen Rowing Club one of the greatest rowing clubs in the history of rowing anywhere in the world. And I'm delighted to say we have the author of a new book about it, Kieran McCarthy, here with us in studio. The book is called Something in the Water. Good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning. How are you? You were at the Book Awards last night? Yeah, Irish Book Awards in the Convention Centre. So the book was nominated for the Irish Sports Book of the Year. Um, Richard Sadler took the top gong, but just to be in the reckoning and running for that alone was phenomenal. So it's kind of um, it's a testament, I suppose, to the, to the people of Skibbereen Rowing Club and, and the club's story that it's even even reached that level to be kind of um, to be shortlisted for an award like that. So it's kind of... Yeah. yeah, it has crossover appeal, I think because of the characters involved, but also when you start to kind of drill down and see how many uh, high-end competitors there have been, it's not just the two lads. It's, it's an absolutely phenomenal club. Um, people probably don't realise, even before Gary and Paul, I think the public consciousness people people kind of took notice of the Skipping Rowing Club back in 2016 when Gary and Paul O'Donovan went to the Olympics and won Ireland's first ever Olympic, um, Olympic rowing medal. But even before that, the, the club had three Olympians in, in the noughties. They did Timmy Harnaday, they did Richard Coakley, and they did Eugene Coakley. And go back to the 70s, Nuala Lupton was the club's first international oars person. So this club has been continually producing international class oars people year after year after year. So um, it's just great to get their story out there. And even go back to this year's World Senior Rowing Championships, 10 of the Irish team were from Skibbereen Rowing Club. Kind of, it's incredible when you think about it like that. Ireland sent out their team there and 10 of them were from, just from the same rowing club. This small little pocket in rural West Cork is producing these international class athletes year after year after year. It's, it's a conveyor belt for them. I want to play this because um, we did a, a show in 2017. We went down for a road show and uh, some of the OTB crew even got a chance to row around the stretches of water, which made Skibbereen such a special location for rowers. Have a look at this. I'll make sure the lads do some work as well. I'd say uh, that's potential, definitely. I reckon so, yeah. You think, uh, Kevin? Maybe not in rowing. I definitely think they're nice fellas, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Cabal's career might have a second act. I'd say he might have a second act, yeah. He's still staying fit. I was watching the Credit Union in Skibbereen. Enjoyed the crowd in there. Difficult to watch. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a close one. I had a son in Rio, though. He was, uh, he was there amongst the gang. I was represented. Golly, uh, I was great to see him fighting for a medal. And uh, I was, it dawned on us that there was a possibility of getting a gold medal, you know? So, so close. Anyway, we were willing to wait until Tokyo. So I'm, sa I'm saving up for Tokyo now. I might get, I might get as well as Tokyo. We say in West Cork, if the Lord spares me. Mm, it's the distance we can row, I think. Uh, in safety, we can row most of the year. Uh, conditions don't really beat us that much, you know. There are places, if we can get out, there are spots in the river where we can get out to, where we can row up to 2K. Dominic Casey, all in the you know. The secret, the secret in rowing is getting the mileage. Mileage, he always says. And uh, you can actually do it here, you know. There's uh, very little activity on this river, you know. What's done on this river is mostly, um, it's mostly for pleasure now, you know. If you go to more uh, industrialised places where they're, they're trying to row on the rivers, it's, it's quite difficult. Most times we can row all the time here. Yeah. Yeah, work out, yeah, go for the shoulders, I'm feeling it in the shoulders now, but it was just good, it was a little bit choppy just getting started, but the technique, it's really tough from the technique, getting, foot, uh, getting it all going, certainly just getting your hands going to start with, and then of course then moving on the seat as well, getting all the motion all in one, so it took a bit of time, but got there in the end, and yeah, it was good, really good fun. I've ordered my boots as I can't. Kevin is a natural. <laughs> And Adrian was showing up all his skills from years ago. He lived up to all the high school. Oh, I tell you, it was, there, there was a lot of that, a lot of talk. <laughs> too much, too much talk from him, but he was actually very good. Yeah, so apparently the water is important. Uh, the, the actual, um, that ability to get out on the water all year round matters. They're so, so lucky he's given the wrong club because if they fall out of the club and the Island River is right there waiting for them, and like club captain Sean O'Brien said there, they have it to themselves. So from, from the clubhouse right down to where the island meets the Atlantic, they have 12, 14 kilometres of the river just for themselves. And it's, it's a river full of character too. I think it's one of the most important um, characters in the Rowan Club and it's, it's a huge reason that the Rowan Club has achieved what it has because there's all different conditions there. They've dog leg, um, there's old court, new court, 
they have stretches there. What for does that mean? Sorry, what's old court, new court? Old court, new court. They're, they're both, they're, they're corners. They're, they're two corners. For the, for, so they, you have to turn around. One is a dog leg left, one is a dog leg right. So it's not just a straight river. So these roars are, they're rowing in all conditions. And even when it comes to corner, um, when, on Saturdays when they do their training spins, it's a race to get to the first corner first. So from the very start with these roars, go on the water, everything's a race. You know, kind of, Gary and Paul were chasing um, Richard Coakley, Timmy Harnady and Richard Coakley. As kids, basically. As kids. They, they were out there in the river, they were chasing them. So that river is just a phenomenal kind of, it's a nursery ground for, 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 for the club and what they can achieve. And what's very interesting too about it, um, at one point there, there's a two kilometre stretch and just kind of sitting up in a hill is Dominic Casey's house. And like Dominic Casey is kind of the mastermind behind it all. If, if he walked into, if you walked on Dublin now, nobody would know who he is. No. They wouldn't know who he, was, who he is, but he's the man who's overseen such a golden generation in Irish rowing since he um, became the Rowing Ireland lightweight coach back in 2015, Olympic medals, world champions year after year after year, European champions, um, rowing World Cup medals, and he's, he's the man behind it all. And his house is a stunning house, just perched right above, up in a hill overlooking everything. So whatever moves in that river, he can spot. And, um, for, for the book, I spent a bit of time up there um, with, with, with Dominic and his wife Eleanor and Dominic is kind of quite reserved, he won't tell you too much. Um, Seems very humble as well, won't take any of the credits, like, you know, um, I'm a, a judge in the Signify Manager of the Year, it used to be the Phillips, and he just won't accept the prize on behalf of the rowers. It's always another high performance guy has to get it or somebody mm -hmm. else has to get it, but like everybody knows, you're the guy. Exactly, that's exactly it. He so prefers to stand in the background. Um, we, we run kind of um, sports awards down in West Cork, the West Cork Sports Star Awards, and a couple of times back in 2016 after Gary and Paul qualified for the Olympics, they were presented with a monthly award, and it's a nice little function for them, but Dominic never turned up. He preferred to take juniors out in the river that, that, day, that evening instead. And then at the next year's Ganagal Awards, um, we decided to kind of induct Dominic into the Hall of Fame. But we knew if we told Dominic beforehand that he wouldn't, come. he wouldn't come. So we kind of had to get his wife Eleanor on board and one or two more from the club and just get him there on the night and didn't surprise him because he just does not like the limelight. He just prefers to let the athletes kind of kind of take the glory and kind of reap the benefits of it. He's a he's an intriguing character. Is he hard? Is he is he tough? Like is he uh, you know what what is it that so rowing seems to be one of the hardest sports and certainly if you talk to the journalists who've covered that and a bunch of other things they say the rowers were the hardest people that they've ever met mm -hmm. like they they row until their hands are covered in blisters and then when their hands are covered in blisters they go out and they row again because otherwise they feel like they're falling behind their competitors um and like the weight is such an issue for them so mm -hmm. they have all the concerns and the mental anguish of the jockeys and they have all the physical issues that a any sports person like that, like the the training is harder than the training for a boxer. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a level of elite athleticism that we don't fully appreciate because you're sitting down in the boat. And we don't really see it that much. But um, to get people to do that, you either need to be incredibly charismatic mm -hmm. or you need to be very hard as well. What what what's his character like? What's that combination? He's even though he doesn't have a degree, in, a degree in psychology, he's the ultimate psychologist because he's always using reverse psychology with the rowers, um, kind of trying to get the most out of them. There was a in the book I talk about this John Whelley. He's this young fellow who took up rowing when he was 16 or 17 and jammed out in the water the first day, and he hated it. He said he, his bones were aching, there was muscles in his body he didn't even know existed were actually revolting against him. So he came off the water and um, he was saying in his own head, own head, I'm not coming back, this is it, I'm finished, I'm never going rowing again. And next thing he said, he met, he met Dominic Casey for the first time. Dominic walked down to him, how'd you get on? And he kind of said, John Willie, okay, um, well that's it, you're in. And he goes, how do you mean I'm in? Because they, they wanted another rower for a boat and he goes, you're the fourth person in that boat, you can't let the other boys down. And all of a sudden, in John Willie's head, he was like, I can't let these fellas down. And he came back, and a year later he won his first national title. A year after that, he wrote for Ireland. Right. So he obviously has a good talent spot as well. Ah, oh, he's just yeah. He, he does like he kind yeah, of I couldn't row. I'd been like, yeah, no worries, that's okay. I'll yeah. go. But, it looked a bit tough out there for you, was it? What he used to do as well is intriguing. He kind of he likes tall people. He kind of long levers. You know, he 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 believes that they work. That they're they're the best rowers. So he used to send some of the some of the rowers in the club in, in, into school, find find someone tall and bring them out to me. Right. And once he has the raw ingredients, he can work with that then, you know, kind of, he's his training, training plan in place. Um, you have to commit, you have to be dedicated. Um, if he knows you have talent, 
he will give you all the time in the world. But if you don't give something back to him, he'll very kind of smoothly kind of walk away. Do you know, kind of he's not forceful. He won't tell you do, do not come back here. But he'll turn his attention to someone who will give the commitment and desire that he wants. What did he learn about the relationship between Paul and Gary during the, the writing of this book? Uh, like, there's a, a great passage from a regatta in 2016 where they're tearing strips off each other in the build-up to Rio, and then there's actually kind of a revelation which I hadn't heard that on the day of the final in Rio, uh, Gary kind of abandons the game plan entirely and just says, uh, let's go now 400 metres from the finish line when actually that's double the length that they should be going all out and pulling like a dog, as they put it. It is, uh, um, Gary and Paul have just, like, they're obviously brothers, so they get on really well. Um, I've kind of known them since I've been down in West Cork, and they're just, uh, they just bounce off each other really well. I remember I've interviewed them before, and they'd start fighting in front of you. Like, there's no, there's no kind of, um, there's no filter there with the two of them, and it just works really well, the two of them, in, in the boat together. Um, so, like you're sitting there talking about the Olympic final that time, like, that was incredible what, what Gary and Paul did for, I suppose, for Irish rowing, and that's actually kind of, that's opened the door for the success that's come since then. Like, there's four Irish crews going to next year's Olympics. Mm -hmm. And you can trace a lot of that back to what Gary and Paul achieved in 2016 because suddenly rowing became... It, it was a sport that people who wouldn't normally look at the sport were looking at it and they were taking an interest in. That's down to, to Gary and Paul's talent and their personality because together it just works um, what, what the, two, the two boys have. Um, that Olympic final, like you said there, was kind of... Um, it was go. Like cool, th yeah. that, was, that was the call. There was only two words spoken in the boat that day. Um, first one was good, and it was Gary again, and then the second word was go. What would good mean? Good start. Okay. They they were kind of happy. They were um, even though we wouldn't have seen it, the naked eye wouldn't have seen it, but they weren't happy with the first two or three strokes in that final. It, it was a bit wobbly, but again, that's the kind of I suppose the the experts and that they are. But um, Gary called go, and that means just up everything, up the rate, up the intensity, go now, go now, because they just felt it. You know, you could have a feeling in the boat, and um, just the two of them together, they work so, so well. But what's interesting now is Gary's not in the boat. Mm. You know, you're looking at that Irish lightweight double that is qualified for next year's Olympics, and it comes back to Skibbereen again. There's five Skibbereen rowers competing for two seats in that boat. Again, it's incredible. And it's two sets of brothers. You've Gary and Paul O'Donovan, you've a set of twins, Finton and Jake McCarthy, and there's kind of a wild card after coming back in, Shane O'Driscoll who is best friends with Gary and Paul, and he grew up across the field from Gary and Paul, and they're all from the same parish. So what you have is five skip men competing for two seats in a boat for next year's Olympics. So, um, and Dominic Casey is their coach. So again, it's a boat with Skibbereen all over it again. And that boat, when it goes to the Olympics next year, will be favourites for the gold. Because for the last two years, the Irish lightweight double has won gold at the World Championship. So you have a real live medal prospect there. So is there a power rankings at the moment of <laughs> who's most likely to be in it? Well, you're, to, to be fair to the rest of them, it's Paul plus one. Yeah. You know, I think we've kind of, that, that, that's no secret there. Um, Paul is a world champion the last four years, twice in the single and twice in the double. Like, he's Ireland's greatest ever roar, and he's only 25, 26, you know, yeah. kind of. Um, How long can he continue? Like, what's that? Well, if you're looking at, at the lightweight rowing, next year's Olympics is possibly, and it looks like it'll be the last year that there will be lightweight rowing right. in the Olympics. So, unless the, the lads decide to step up the heavyweight, but that's easier said than done. Shane O'Driscoll, Shane O'Driscoll and Mark O'Donovan tried that um, two years ago. They won, they dominated the lightweight pair, which is a different boat to Gary and Paul's, stepped up to the heavyweight and just didn't work out. Yeah. They finished 21st at the Worlds this year, so that's why Shane has come back down. So, um, again, it, it shows, again, Skibbereen, they're still churning out these athletes. And so it's Paul plus, phew, you take your pick, because Finton was in the boat that won World Gold a couple of months ago. Gary was in the boat that won World Gold a couple of years ago. At a recent trial, Shane was the one in the driving seat with Paul. So I don't envy Dominic Casey over the next couple of months. How do they decide? Trials. There'll be a lot of trials. Is it? like? But it it's fractions of seconds we're dealing with. Are you, are you tried as an individual or are you tried as how you are as part of a partnership? Because if it is Paul plus one, you might be the best partner, but mm -hmm. you might not be the fastest. In, I, I don't know if that's true or not. But Exactly. I could, they'll try all the different combinations. Right. They, they, they'll try a lot from here, here into next year. Um, just to find, like, they were, they were on, a, on a training camp there a couple of weeks ago in Bagnoli's, and Gary actually headed out early himself just to get a head start because there's fierce pressure on these lads now because sure, yeah. when you're looking at next year's Olympics, if it is the last Olympic Games with lightweight rowing for the likes of Paul and Gary O'Donovan, this could be their last chance to ever win an Olympic gold medal and that's what they want. Um, they won silver and the country exploded in celebration, but they weren't happy. They actually weren't happy with that, you know, kind of. Um, Paul found it very hard after 
to watch the Olympic final back because the lads are born winners and they want gold. So what better way to bow next year with a gold? Yeah, a uh, follow up to the book, I imagine, if, uh, if they do. <laughs> yeah, the, it's, it's the, the next chapter is live at the moment, as you yeah. say. So. <laughs> yeah, in documentary form. Well, listen, best of luck with it. Congratulations on it. It's, um, it. It looks great and it's a great read. So mm. it's the type of thing that I think is going to have crossover appeal because the lads have crossover appeal and I hope it, uh, it sells in its tens of thousands. Congratulations, Karen. Thanks Brilliant. for joining us. Thanks, George. Thanks for having me. Uh,